if you can, please stay muted during the presentation. If you have questions during the presentation, go ahead and use the chat feature. Uh, we'll try to monitor those during the chat, but we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end as well. And with that being said, I'm going to turn it on over to Ronnie and David. Okay, well, thank you, Matt. Uh, this is Ron Davis, and here with my uh, associate, uh, David Wiley. And uh, we're going to take about 45 minutes to an hour to uh, go through about 40-some uh, slides. So welcome, everybody. Good afternoon, or I guess it might be a uh, good morning to a few of you. So, uh, David, if you want to take us down to slide number two, uh, let me just give you a a summary of what we're going to uh, talk about first. Uh, uh, David uh, has got some uh, new data that we are just picking up right now from a uh, recently in, uh, initiated survey of printers. Uh, so this is real, real hot data, literally off the uh, off the press. Then we're going to talk about economic and uh, print outlook, um, and of course. Uh, we're sort of rolling the dice at this time in terms of talking about outlooks because who knows what's going to happen over the next uh, few months, few quarters, or year or so. But uh, we're going to give it a shot in terms of uh, what we think uh, the economy and print markets might look like uh, going forward. Uh, then we're going to look at uh, look back a little bit in terms of what happened in the last uh, recession and how print uh, uh, the, the the pattern of print uh, and how that uh, went. Uh, then we're going to look at uh, the print economy and book manufacturing, uh, get uh, deep into that. David's going to cover that, and he's going to cover key trends in book readership, consumption, and demand. And then uh, we'll look at uh, kind of um, uh, beneath the hood of some book manufacturers in terms of recent uh, uh, income statement and operating metrics, and then uh, get into some key management issues uh, that we think are important, and I'm sure you'll probably be able to think of a few others. Uh, but these are uh, trying times, uh, but we're going to see what we can make of it as we go through here. So, David, if you want to move us along a little bit, um, and I'm going to ask him to go over this uh, recent survey data that he's been involved with, with uh, the new organization. David? Yeah. So. We recently put together, you know, a new survey between, you know, Printing United Alliance and NAPCO Research. And what we're doing is we are kind of getting some live info on what is happening to printers throughout the whole pandemic situation. Um, as time goes on, you know, we're trying to put this survey out every, once every two weeks. So the questions are going to evolve, the indicators are going to evolve, and we're going to get to see, you know, a good trend of you know, as things recover, how quickly they're going to recover. And it's definitely going to be interesting to see, you know, what happens as we go on. Um, looking at first, first um, data that we ga gathered during this survey, it's easy to see that things have not been going so hot the last 30 days for pretty much all segments of print. Um, you know, all we, there's about 100 companies or 400 companies surveyed. Um, here and most of them are experiencing a change in sales of you know more than 50% down from what they were seeing before the pandemic hit. Um, one of the bright things that we have seen uh, in the responses for the survey is that people across all of these different segments were saying that things were looking so great before the pandemic hit. You know they were they had more orders than they could fill. They were you know, they were doing about just as good as they have at any time in the past. So the pandemic really hurt a lot of people across all these different segments. Um, you can see the package printing and converting obviously was not hit as hard because a lot of a lot of these companies in that particular segment are dealing with food and, you know, essential items that they're pushing to keep restocking. So that's why this number, you know, they weren't affected as much. But like I said, this research is ongoing and we're hoping to get a lot more data going forward with it. Um, for more information, obviously you could check out the different websites and you know, it, it will evolve as time goes on. Um, as far as book sales during COVID, there were a few bright spots. Um, according to NPD book scan, between March 1st and April 4th, demand did spike in a few categories. And all the percentages you're seeing here are um, what these particular uh, these particular books are up from the same time last year. 
So outdoor skills, medical history, people are, you know, reading up about what the 1918 flu pandemic was all about. Um, Games and activity books, you know, people being quarantined, literary fiction was up 10% during this time period. And children's nonfiction has actually been the thing we've seen that's had the greatest spike, you know, between both periods. Between March 1st and April 4th, it went up, you know, the week ending March 21st, it went up about 66% comparable to last year. And then the week ending May 2nd, it went up about 28.4% in comparison to last year. And I'll dive deeper into this later. I have a chart with um, a bunch of different segments, and we'll see how they compare to the numbers last year. But in total, uh, book, print and book sales were up about 4.7%, you know, which is good given the circumstances. Um, as far as the most recent jobs report data, obviously, we expected the unemployment rate to skyrocket throughout all this, um, the increase of over 10% was the largest month-to-month -month increase in the history of the BLS putting out this jobs report. Um, in total, 20.5 million jobs were lost or, you know, workers were furloughed. So it's, you know, you don't really want to say lost when people could be coming back. And in the manufacturing sector, you know, it made up a smaller portion of all the jobs that were lost. About 1.3 million were lost and, you know, 66% of these were in durable good manufacturing. Um, another bright spot that goes along with this and, you know, that makes this different from, you know, recessions of the past and big uh, chunks of job loss in the past is that a recent survey went out by Washington Post and 77% of those who responded to that survey believe that they will, you know, return to the job that they had prior when their econ economy opens. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see if that number was even higher than, you know, 77% getting back. Um, so now Ronnie is going to talk a little bit about the economic and print outlook. Okay, thank you, David. Interesting, interesting information. So now we're going to look forward a little bit. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, David and I both have been, you know, following this, obviously, uh, as things started to uh, develop with the pandemic and uh, looking at all the uh, economic data coming out and, uh, you know, our view basically uh, is that there's sort of three uh, kind of equally uh, possible scenarios out there over the next 12 months. And you've heard about these, you know, in different descriptions, a, a short, quick, quick, short recession, kind of the V recession, uh, you know, around one third uh, chance, a longer extended recession, uh, more of a more of a traditional U, I guess, and then uh, more of a sustained, a lingering recession, um, kind of an elongated U. So, so those are sort of the three um, uh, characteristic uh, scenarios that, that might come up. And if, if we look a little bit deeper, um, and this 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 forecast here, uh, I guess we did this about a month ago, and actually we were pretty good on the first quarter. Our estimate was. Uh, uh, the first quarter would be down about 5%. It ended up down 4.8 when they came out with a preliminary number. So uh, uh, we were pretty close on that. But then you get to the second quarter and, uh, you know, there's numbers are all over the place, but, you know, we're sort of in the middle with about an expected of maybe a 25% drop that quarter because of so many things being closed during the second quarter. But as we slowly start to open up the economy, uh, all three scenarios show, you know, that we're going to go up from there. It just it's a matter of how fast. Uh, you know, the quickest is the V scenario going uh, up quickly, obviously, and then the uh, more traditional U a little bit slower, and the elongated U a little bit slower, uh, even from that. But in all cases, uh, you know, we believe probably by the first quarter anyway of next year, even under the the, the most pessimistic scenario. That we should be um, uh, should be um, back up into positive growth territory. Looking a little deeper uh, in terms of how long is this going to last? You know, if you look at sort of the, the the average recessions, and the most relevant is that 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 bar on the right there, the 1945 to 2001. Uh, you know, the average recession has been uh, you know around uh, ten months, uh, three quarters. Um, in terms of start to finish, uh, so we should hopefully get within that range, uh, maybe even even a little less. We'll see. 
Uh, looking a little deeper yet, uh, you know, that's what GDP looked like uh, in terms of the 2007-2011 uh, period where we looked at the so-called Great Recession and that, that severe drop about uh, over 8% there in quarter four. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we're, obviously we're going to beat that as we get into the, uh, the second quarter in the uh, the next recession, if we can look at that next slide, David, where we look at the 2016 to 220 and, and uh, the pandemic recession or whatever, ultimately we give the, the uh, name to this one, uh, you know, we're probably going to drop somewhere around 25%. So it's certainly going to be uh, unprecedented uh, in terms of the drop in terms of where we're going over the next quarter or two. Uh, continuing along, uh, you can ask, well, you know, why is this recession different? Well, most obviously it's different because it, you know, it, it, it came from the uh, pandemic. It wasn't any kind of internal um, uh, poor risk management caused by, uh, you know, banks or, or uh, government, uh, but it's uh, caused by this uh, totally external pandemic hit on uh, what otherwise was was a just extremely robust economy. So, so you had uh, uh, two extremes, you know, the, the very robust economy and all of a sudden the, uh, the, the, the closing down of uh, almost all of that economy. Uh, we think that millions of uh, we're going to have their jobs uh, to return to uh, once this, uh, this, this uh, economy kind of goes through the cycle um, and there has been certainly the uh, the, the stimulus package uh, that went out uh, both for businesses and for uh, consumers so we think that uh, you know once we open back up there will be some pent up demand uh, some industries are going to take longer to recover than others but uh, you know we do look for uh, uh, again, no later than the first quarter of uh, 2021, a pretty strong recovery. Uh, continuing on, uh, there will be, though, uh, we think some some kind of market shifts, and I'm sure that you know we aren't identifying all of them yet, but you know we think that we can see some uh, the U.S. economy gaining some uh, strength ultimately, as opposed to uh, China from this. There could be some, uh, and will be, uh, some deglobalization in terms of uh, more uh, these, uh, what we typically are calling now strategic sourcing of strategic goods uh, and services uh, back to the uh, U.S. economy. Uh, we've been forced into uh, this implementation of what uh, economists call the uh, new monetary theory of, in effect, borrowing and borrowing and borrowing, uh, not worrying about it. Uh, we seem to be in that mode right now with uh, trillions of dollars of new debt being uh, added to the national debt. Uh, but consumers and businesses are probably going to be more skittish on your spending and investment for a while, as typically happens. And some print sectors, such as packaging, wrappers, and wrappers and labels, are certainly gaining, uh, and they've always been uh, less uh, or more resilient, I guess I should say, and less uh, cyclical than uh, some of the other sectors. And also, as uh, as David said, uh, uh, books have been actually uh, one of the better sectors. Uh, given that people have more time uh, to read. I know I recently ordered some books off of Amazon and they seem to be taking a lot longer to get here than they used to. So uh, moving on, uh, I think there's a lot of stories to watch uh, in terms of, uh, you know, keeping an eye on infection rates and as states uh, start to open up uh, and see what happens there. That's a big question mark. and. Uh, uh, David's home state, David uh, lives in Youngstown, uh, is taking steps to open this week, and uh, we're going to see what happens with that. Uh, the government, you know, has signaled uh, that they are willing, the government seems always willing to spend money, so they're willing to, I think, spend more uh, for various sectors if uh, we take a hit here or there. Um, there's probably going to be some funding, and this is, you know, our lobbyist, uh, Elizabeth uh, uh, Lions is very active uh, the postal situation right now uh, to keep uh, the postal system going because they deliver a large volume of what uh, print is out there. 
uh, we're increasing our test uh, in terms of uh, what experts say. Testing is one of the keys. And uh, some countries in Europe are beginning to open schools uh, again. So we're right now in this period of seeing what happens as we move, uh, as we move forward. So there's a lot of stories to watch uh, with that. Uh, moving ahead, um, looking back um, uh, at Prince's reaction to the last Great Recession, I think there's some, uh, uh, you know, some uh, evidence there as to how uh, how this might go. And uh, as we've often said, uh, you know, print uh, print does best uh, in mature recoveries, but it certainly does worse than most other sectors in recessions. It generally uh, goes down faster, it goes down further takes a little longer to come back. And as you can see, uh, the typical printer sales pattern, this is all types of printers. In the Great Recession was that, uh, you know, the worst year there, sales on an annual basis, on an annual basis, were down uh, uh, over 10% uh, into the negative. But when you add in where they were in the positive before, they were down, you know, 12, 13%. So print's uh, certainly going to take a hit. As we move along through this one, uh, printers' profits uh, took a hit. The average profit rate for all printers uh, in the worst year of the Great Recession there, 2010, which mostly reflected the accounting year 2009. Profits were a negative 5% as an industry. Uh, excuse me, I mean uh, negative about 1.5% as an industry. Uh, but most of the profits uh, generally are made by what we call profit leaders. You know, they maintain profitability, the top 25% all through that uh, Great Recession. Uh, they were still profitable. Uh, however, the other 75% of printers lost about 4% uh, during the uh, Great Recession, and I think we're going to see that pattern again. Uh, so where do we think uh, sales are going to go over the next 12 months for print overall? Uh, you know, probably I think somewhere between 15 and 25 percent overall. Uh, you know, I still think uh, uh, this could be a, a quick short recession, maybe uh, extending a little bit longer. But I think if we're, you know, we only see a, a big negative in the second quarter and somewhat negative in the third, I think by the fourth quarter, we could be coming back, and uh, on an annual basis, then uh, you know sales might uh, end up going down about 15% or so. Printer profit rates, uh, I think overall the industry is probably going to be down about 2%, uh, lose 2% in sales over, the, not in sales, but 2% uh, uh, negative in terms of uh, profit on sales. Over the next uh, 12 months, uh, profit leaders will probably end up still in the red, making, excuse me, in the black, making about 6% on sales, and profit challengers just the opposite, in the red, about uh, 6%. So, uh, you know, that's our outlook uh, in terms of where uh, print's going to go over the next uh, 12 months. Uh, doesn't, you know, obviously doesn't look good. But uh, I think, uh, you know, we're going to see some shakeouts, we're going to see some bankruptcies, we're going to see some, uh, uh, some mergers, uh, so we're going to lose, certainly lose some, uh, some firms. But uh, all in all, it's going to be a little worse than the Great Recession, but I think we're going to come out on the other end, uh, you know, by the uh, end of the year. If we want to continue along, uh, David, I want to turn it over now back to David. And he's going to talk about uh, uh, more specifics in terms of book manufacturing. Go ahead, David. All right, thanks, Ronnie. Yeah, so this um, survey seen here is from the National Association of Manufacturers. And obviously, this was taken before uh, the pandemic hit. You know, it was a fourth, it was technically their first quarter survey. You know, it was completed during the fourth quarter of last year. But the reason that I wanted to keep it on here is because some of these challenges that manufacturers were anticipating are going to still be issues in the coming year. Um, there's obviously still going to be many trade uncertainties, uncertainties when this all goes back to normal, um, if we could even say normal, because who knows how much, you know, the typical modes of operation will change throughout all this. Um, obviously, with a you know, either an existing administration staying or a new administration coming in, there's always going to be, you know, 
healthcare costs. So rising healthcare and insurance costs are definitely going to be an issue going forward for um, manufacturers. And then, you know, weaker global growth and so are export sales. Um, the fifth one down on that list, that could be an issue as, you know, maybe people are coming and, you know, creating products domestically more or, you know, some companies might keep keep um, doing what they were doing before the pandemic and not switch anything up. So these are issues, you know, that manufacturers are going to face going forward, even, you know, attracting a quality workforce for some firms that may have lost and, you know, things are going to recover and they're going to need to fill those spots again. So obviously, even though, you know, unemployment's high at the moment and people aren't really looking to hire, this is still going to be an issue moving forward. Um, this is just an overview of the latest census data as far as print and publishing um, numbers. One thing that we could take positive from this is that these numbers are released, you know, on a lagging basis. So we saw the 2016 numbers and then just at the beginning of this year, the 2017 numbers came out. And a positive for commercial book, which is that NAIS, NAICS segment 323117 was that employment did rise and the number of its establishments that, uh, rose throughout the year as well. Um, for print-related media, for those 511 codes for the book industry, um, employment did go up by about 8,000 between 2016 and 2017, but the number of establishments did drop pretty significantly, which does show, you know, that there was consolidation in that particular segment. Um, if we look at the latest BLS jobs report, we could see that after the Great Recession, um, employment within publishing did fall pretty drastically and it bottomed out in 2015. But since then, it has been on a decline. And then, you know, after 2018, and, you know, obviously we saw record low unemployment rates across every segment, we saw this number spike. But it's easy to see just how, how much this number dropped between the beginning of the year and, you know, the April jobs report release. You could see that Know, there were about 20,000 jobs lost. So aside from that, I'm going to talk about some key trends in book readership, consumption, and demand. Um, a recent survey by Pew asked people um, what types of books they read in the past 12 months, and you know, only one percent said they read zero book or yeah didn't read any books. Um, print books only, this number to 37% actually increased from the iteration of the report that we did last year. I believe it was down in the low 30s. So it shows that more people were choosing to only read print books. And the both print and digital uh, response, you know, 20%, that also rose from the last iteration of the report, which I think was, you know, mid 20. So it didn't raise by much, but you know, as long as you're seeing that number go up where people are continuing to read print books, you know, it is obviously good for the industry. Um, this just goes deeper into some of the demographics for, um, you know, what kind of people are reading different kinds of books. One of the bright spots that we do see here is that um, younger people are choosing to read print books. You know, 74% of the people between 18 and 29 are reading print books, um, which it's always good to have the young cohort on your side. Um, and this number surprisingly did drop a little bit as you know people got older and then you know once you get 65 plus the number you know did go back up a bit. Um, one of the things to pay attention to here is that you know more people did signal that they were reading ebooks than they were listening to audiobooks, which um, you know was interesting to me as the rise of things like Audible and different just sources for audiobooks has come into play. And obviously it is a concern of the industry as we're moving forward that these different um, audiobook platforms are becoming more and more popular. But these numbers here show that, you know, there's still a good chunk for all of these different demographics that are reading print books. Um, if we look at how ebook consumption has trended over the past few years, we see in you know 2011, not many people were on the ebook train, and then I believe it was between you know 2011 and 2014 when you saw things like the Nook, the Kindle, 
all those different things come out. So obviously we saw a big spike in the number of people that were consuming eBooks. But um, as time has gone on, we've kind of seen that number plateau. And I think that this is kind of a trend we're going to see moving forward, especially with the rise in popularity of um, audiobooks, podcasts, stuff like that. Speaking of audiobooks, here is the trend line for how those numbers have looked since 2011. Obviously, you could see that there is indeed a steady rise um, going forward. And, you know, we don't expect any huge spikes, which if there was a huge spike, we probably would have seen it by now with um, the introduction of Audible, as I mentioned before, which, you know, is Amazon's Amazon's um, platform for audiobooks. So we're seeing a steady rise of this and we can anticipate it to be steady going forward. But like I said, nothing, nothing extreme is on the horizon here. Another, another interesting development as far as, you know, the book segment goes is that the number of independent bookstores has consistently been on the rise for the past decade. Um, you know, you, you, you used to have companies like Borders and, you know, obviously most of them, if not all of them have shut their doors. Um, Barnes and Nobles are becoming less and less popular and these independent bookstores are filling the void because people do still want to go out and people want to, you know, purchase these books. These independent bookstores give people a chance to, you know, meet artists when they're on different book tours and, you know, just partake in different events and just somewhere to go to be able to purchase their print books. So this is definitely a good trend to see moving forward and we can expect this number to rise, especially as more and more consolidation takes place within the brick and mortar industry. Um, this is, you know, a little bit more info on what I mentioned in the first slide. It's easy to see here how um, each segment was affected kind of between May of last year and May of this year, even with COVID affecting different numbers, you could see that most of these categories were up. Um, the only place where we saw a huge kind of decrease was board books when they're down around 20% from the last year. And then, you know, um, young adult fiction actually did drop a little bit, but you could see that, you know, ju juvenile nonfiction did take a big spike um, from the numbers last year. And, you know, just, even seeing adult nonfiction, adult fiction, you know, rise in that manner is good for the industry. And, you know, anytime you look at your numbers between now and the previous year, seeing a spike is a good thing. Um, one concern that we've seen when looking at um, the census numbers is that print book revenue is converging kind of with online book revenue. We could see that on on book revenue is consistently rising each year and print book revenue is kind of taking a little drop. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the numbers look when 2019 and obviously don't have 2020 numbers yet. And cause it'll be interesting to see as those encompass kind of COVID related stuff and to see how many people actually did choose, you know, like Ron mentioned before, it's shipping issues right now or sometimes taking you know, making books longer to, taking longer to get in, but, um, you know, if people go online and get them, you know, they may be doing so during this time. And then, you know, the rise in self-publishing, this goes kind of hand in hand with new, um, you know, print on demand. So as you see the rise in self-publishing, you're going to see, you know, people demanding their books be printed on demand, so to speak. Um, and it's good to see that this number is consistently rising as we go. And obviously, you know, you'll see consolidation in the major publishers, like we saw for um, when I showed you the Census Bureau data previously. Um, and I think as more consolidation happens, people are going to stray away from, you know, the mass market and kind of try to do it on their own. Um, you know, just a little bit of industry news. This was a stock watch, and the reason that I left it um, what, for December 2018 and December 2019, before COVID all hit, was to, sh I didn't want really all the COVID, you know, stock issues to be incorporated in this data. I wanted you guys to see kind of how things were going before this hit, because I think that once, 
you know, things do recover, things are going to go back to the norm. And, you know, this is how different publishers and book companies and manufacturers within the industry were seeing their stocks move, um, you know, between fourth quarter of 2018 and fourth quarter of 2019. Um, obviously, it's no secret now that, you know, LSE and Quad's merger did not go through. Um, and that resulted in LSE filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Um, they said there was an unprecedented drop in demand for their catalogs and magazine segment. And then they also did see, you know, a hefty decrease in book sales from the first quarter of 2019 on. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the different book manufacturing income and operating metrics. And what I'm going to do is kind of take a show you what the average printer and what the average book printers um, metrics look like and how they changed between the Great Recession and now and kind of what you could, I just want to show you kind of what you could expect years to look like. And if you're trying to, you know, reach a benchmark, this is what the average looked like for all these different, um, you know, this different timeline. So for profit as a percent of sales, you could see in 2010, immediately following the last great recession, book printers were receiving a hefty profit. And, you know, whether, whether, you know, you guys are sitting here, if you experienced that, then, you know, obviously it was a great time and we'd like to get back to that. But as the economy leveled off and recovered um, as time went on in 2015, you could see that book printers were still making more of a profit than regular printers. And that trend did continue to the latest iteration of our um, dynamic ratios. And I, I guess I should clarify that before I go any further, that all these numbers do come from what was formerly the PIA dynamic ratios. <clears throat> and, you know, we plan on getting as many people in here so that we could keep these metrics, you know, updated moving forward. So if you're considering, you know, benchmarking yours against other industries and you want to see more info like this, obviously, you know, reach out and participate in the ratios. Um, so that's how profit reacted after the Great Recession moving forward. As far as major costs went for different printers, this is just strictly for book printers, you could see that paper did spike in price around 2015, but it did recover. It went down to about 25% of, you know, a book printer's cost of sales, um, you know, anything over 30 like it was in 2015. That it could be brutal when it comes to affecting the bottom line of a book manufacturer. You could see that as time went on, um, not much other things have changed. Um, factory payroll did decrease as a percent of sales. And, you know, when we look at some employment data moving forward here in the next couple of slides, you'll see why that was most likely the case. Um, and, you know, it does tie into a directly to administrative expenses and sales expenses rising, as you can see in the bottom. And this is where we see the direct reasoning for that number declining. Um, as time has went on, book manufacturers have started to add more sales and administrative staff than factory workers. You know, most likely it's because factories have become more efficient. You could obviously create the same amount of product as you were before with less factory workers. And, you know, more they, most book manufacturers thought it was a good idea to bring in you know, more salespeople, get more product off the shelves, um, you know, get, keep those printers running as long as they could. And that all goes to, you know, salespeople working and doing their job. Um, and then there was a slight also increase in administrative workers throughout this time period as well. Um, sales per employee, you could see that things were pretty, um, pretty consistent throughout the last decade. Um, the Sales per factory worker actually did increase, you know, pretty significantly compared to the um, all workers, obviously, which actually went down. And this could be tied directly to, you know, more factory or less factory workers being involved in the operations. So obviously, less number of factory workers, you're making more, more sales, that number is going to increase. And... For value added per employee, you could see that after 
the Great Recession, you know, the number was pretty low, but it took a, you know, a decent spike as far as factory, you know, value added per factory employee went during 2015 during the recovery period. And, you know, that number has went back down a little and, you know, more to the norm that we expect during, you know, in our latest iterations of the ratios. And that all employees number did jump a little bit as well. And payroll per employee. Um, obviously, as time goes on, you're going to pay your workers more. And this just shows kind of what similar printers, similar book manufacturers are doing at the moment. Um, you know, like I said, if you're trying to reach a benchmark, this is kind of a number you want to look at. And, you know, obviously, when it does come to rehiring and bringing people back in the door and being competitive and making sure that you have, you know, qualified workers, um, it's always good to look around and see kind of what other similar companies are paying just so you're not, you know, losing out on, on these workers or, you know, overpaying when you, you know, could be, could be saving a little bit of money. Um, so now I'm going to pass it back to Ron, who's going to talk about some of these key management issues and kind of wrap things up for us. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, now we're just looking at, I guess our, our label here is management and chaos, which I, I think may be a fit environment. Uh, some kind of key messages in terms of management and some of these maybe are pretty obvious but uh, you know one is most obvious at all is to stay positive uh, in these times of crisis uh, focus on you know the really important issues and certainly uh, in terms of a health crisis uh, this would be your uh, your families uh, your employees and uh, your own health so you know it, it, Take care of that first, obviously, before worrying about the uh, the money issues. Uh, secondly, uh, that uh, in these types of uh, environments, when um, business is a little bit slower, it's a chance to uh, you know think about your business model and perhaps even rethink your business model. Uh, you know, there may be uh, new waves of opportunity. Uh, there may be new print processes that uh, can. Uh, create new efficiencies uh, and uh, new possibilities in terms of delivery, uh, you know, new ways of uh, recruiting and dealing with employees, new ways to cut costs, new ways to increase sales. So sometimes, you know, when uh, uh, we're so busy uh, because business is good, uh, you don't have time to think outside the box in terms of uh, what else uh, should you be doing and the good side of the bad side of this pandemic is it, it can give you that uh, sort of opportunity. Uh, also, I think we need to keep in mind that the uh, United States is the uh, largest economy in the world, it's the strongest economy, we believe it's uh, the most dynamic economy, the most viable, and uh, in the end, uh, you know, we will uh, persevere uh, in, this, uh, in this pandemic and uh, move on. Uh, also, as the economy recovers, uh, you know, print will recover. Uh, it happened uh, uh, almost 11 years ago uh, when we recovered from the Great Recession and then had almost 11 years of, uh, of uh, a, a, a really uh, strong economy, so it will come back. Obviously, in these times, uh, the message is always uh, preserve cash. Uh, in anticipation of reduced sales, uh, use previously arranged lines of credit to make sure that you uh, do preserve cash. They always say cash is king in bad times, and uh, certainly we are there. Uh, in terms of expenses, obviously, you know, do all you can to uh, control expenses, and and to the extent you can, you know, move uh, move fixed expenses to variable expenses so that as revenue goes down, expenses go down. Uh, remain str strategic, even though you're rethinking your business model, uh, I think you still got to think about what is your uh, uh, strategic goals and what are your strategies and uh, you don't want to lose sight of your uh, uh, strategies in uh, these times and you don't want to just, uh, you know, panic and do something that's not within your strategic uh, interest. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, reach out, uh, in this case, this, 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 uh, we say PIA, but in, in your case, it's to BMI and, and that and the resources, uh, 
that Matt has available. Uh, you know, we've always found that uh, belonging to uh, relevant uh, business associations is a, a, it gives uh, businesses a real strength in both uh, surviving recessions and doing better during uh, good times. Uh, above all, you know, remain positive. Uh, again, better times will return. Uh, the American economy uh, since the end of World War II has expanded about 90% of the time, 90% uh, of the quarters, 90% of the years. Uh, we've seen growth in GDP, uh, so that will come back. And the printing industry remains viable, as uh, David mentioned in, in, in some of those charts, you know, people are still reading books and there's still a high demand for our traditional printed books. So uh, I think uh, even in bad times, we have to remain optimistic uh, as we uh, move on. Uh, I think that's our, that's basically our message. Uh, you know, I think we ended up in a, in a positive way there, even though obviously we're, we're into some bad times now. Do thank you all for attending, and I'm going to ask Matt now if we have any questions that uh, any of you have posted that we would uh, need to address. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. That's uh, some some good information, good good nuggets for us to dig through. Um, so now is time to to get your question in. Nothing came through on the chat during the the talk, but uh, now would be a good time to enter your questions, or if you would like to to say it out loud in person. Uh, I won't stop you from that either. So you can unmute yourself to, to ask a question if you prefer. I'll leave it up to you. For the few people on video, I'm seeing if any of you are actually uh, ready to chime in, but it doesn't look like it. Well, Matt, you know, they can always contact either David or I. We've got our... Uh, um, Sales there, and they can yep. contact us directly. And I, I'm not sure. Are you going to send them uh, the powerpoints on this, or? Yeah, I'll, what? Yeah, just because that that'll be the one question that will always come through is, yes, we did record this, and yes, I have the slides, and we'll send it with the copy of the recording for those of you who have registered. It looks like uh, Dave, did you want to ask something? Yeah, I have a a quick question. A lot of your um, analysis was based on a recession history. Um, I don't know if we call this more of a recession or if it's uh, something similar to, um, you know, a, a world war or previous pandemics where mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not so much a financial uh, doing from the economy, but it's some outside uh, occurrence, you know, like this pandemic. Is there any history that shows how the U.S. has recovered from a similar uh, pandemic or uh, situation that's more related to what we're having right right now. Well, that's that's a good question because you're absolutely right that this is not your your typical uh, recession by any means. Uh, it's not self-generated. Uh, of course, you know the last pandemic uh, was uh, back in 2018 2019 with the uh, the, the so-called Spanish flu uh, pandemic and. Uh, you know, certainly, you know, what happened then was that that uh, as we entered the 20s, we had a, a tremendous period of economic vitality. So the only anything close to this, uh, you know, was that 1819 or excuse me, 1918 pandemic. And once once we uh, came out of that, we entered a long period of, uh, of of sustained growth. So you know maybe you know that's the only thing we've got this close to this, and it came out that we we did have very strong growth for the decade uh, following that. So maybe that'll happen. Good good question. Thank you. Uh, we've got a couple in the in the box, but I think I have one. Uh, James Arch, did you have something you wanted to ask? You had raised your hand in the Zoom virtual conference, and I didn't know if that was intentional or not. James, are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. There you go. Did you have okay. something you wanted to ask? Yeah. Uh, we we're talking about the online book sales numbers. Do they include audiobooks? Do those numbers include audiobooks, or is that something that's separate from your? Uh, that would that would be a separate number. Those were for more ebooks, and you know. <laughs> There's some websites too where you could go on 
and just you know read it on their specific platform. But those did not include audiobooks. Thank you. Okay. All right. And then we're going to the chat. We have um, Calvin saying, "How are factories working under the pandemic? Can facilities be structured around social distancing to let them function?" Um, I don't know if David or Ron, if you have anything to to. Well, say I, about I, that, I, I mean, I'm uh, not the expert there, but right. I, I suspect that they, they can, you know, it depends obviously on each person's, each, uh, each of your facilities. But, uh, you know, I, I think if, if your facility um, uh, provides, uh, you know, square footage enough and, uh, uh, of course, you may have to, you know, your cost can go up when you, if, you, if you're instituting uh, social distancing and uh, testing and all that, uh, but I suspect that, uh, you know, we'll still be able to produce books, but I, I could see some costs going up because of all the additional uh, 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 services and purchases and manpower that you're going to have to, uh, to keep things going uh, to follow whatever uh, instructions you might have. Yeah, and if I could interject too, um, based on that, you know, recent survey that we have been putting out, you know, we've been asking people to kind of write what the situation is like they're dealing with. And obviously, you know, it is kind of an unbalanced playing field right now because, you know, depending on your state's orders and mandates and, you know, whether or not you're an essential business, obviously there's you either can't be working or you could be. But, you know, just a few firms that were continu continuing to work through all this, they mentioned that they're taking temperature each day. They're um, putting kind of glass barriers between workers if they're not six feet apart. And, you know, obviously if they are six feet apart, then they're able to stay. And then, you know, if they can get their hands on testing kits, obviously that is hard to do at the moment. But, you know, if they're able to do that, then that's something they've been doing as well. So just some insight from others who are working during this time. Yeah, and, and Calvin, I think if if you check out our Monday or excuse me, last Tuesday's recording, the last fifteen minutes of that, we we did talk to other uh, manufacturers and folks and seeing what they're doing. And and Kent, if you don't mind, uh, I'd love to have you kind of speak to what you guys are doing, and then that leads into you asking your question. Would that be all right? Sure, that's fine. Yep. Thanks. Um, basically, I was just uh, to comment, Calvin, on your question is that uh, we've we've been able to be deemed essential and have remained open. And what we have done is um, every employee has uh, been had their te temperature taken. We've done the exact same thing of social distancing. Um, it was not mandatory for everyone to be wearing a mask. Um, however, the state of Massachusetts just came down with that. Uh, the governor uh, who has uh, proposed a four part. Uh, reopening. Uh, that's part of the reopening. So we will be mandating masks. Um, some employees are are wearing uh, gloves. Some employees are wearing face coverings. Uh, so we have we have uh, we've left it open uh, in that regard. But for the most part, it has been um, as much as business as usual as possible um, to have uh, our our staff uh, performing their functions um, in a safe environment. Uh, we're staying vigilant. Um, those who felt they, they didn't want to come in, um, in the early stages, we s totally said that was fine. Uh, go ahead and self-isolate uh, as you, f you feel, uh, feel you need. Um, so it's been one of those things where it's been a work in progress as we've gone along and have remained, um, above all more human <laughs> than business, uh, in some cases. And I think that's at the, that's at the core of everybody's, um, position I think these days is that we've become a little bit more human over the last two months, um, which I hope we don't lose. <laughs> right. And I, and I will say just to, just to put a period on that point, uh, Calvin, I think if, if you listen to most of the manufacturers we've had on our check-in calls, they would all very much sound a lot like what, what Kent just said, but. Um, and yeah, and on, and on that, I think this has given us uh, a number of us, we could all speak to this on our own personal on our own personal level. But uh, for me, it's been very interesting to see what the actual um, sentiment will be coming out of this and that will there be a return to domestic manufacturing um, in mm -hmm. light of just, I don't want to say it's to be, you know, punitive towards other, other countries, but it's just more towards, let's just think about what's the economy, look historically at what we've done as a nation and say, how can we better our own, our own, uh, not, not to the detriment of other nations, but let's think a little bit more, uh, 
deep uh, about what we're doing as a, as a country. And is, is there any sentiment out there for that? I'd, I'd be interested to know if there is that going to, if that's going to happen in book manufacturing or even printing as a whole. I right. think, I I think what's your company? A good point. I think it's a good point. I think you're going to see, you know, they're calling it strategic sourcing and they talk more about pharmaceuticals and, um, you know, that sort of thing. But I think it could come in terms of other, other products like books too. Very good. Mm -hmm. Right. All right, Callan. Uh, Kent great. is with Bridgeport uh, oh, National great. Binder. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Thanks. Thanks. You bet, Calvin. And I'm going would... to go back on mute. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Kent. Appreciate it. But I would say to, to reiterate your statement and, and what Ronnie just said, what I've been seeing coming out of NAM, uh, the National Association of Manufacturers, is, is I think there will be somewhat of a return to that sentiment. It's just going to be a matter of, of how that manifest itself with the labor market, with the fact that some of those manufacturing facilities that once existed just flat out no longer exist, can't even retool them anymore. Some you can, some you can't, but uh, it's definitely, I think, again, from the information that NAM has been putting out, it looks like we may see that and I hope that that will continue. Uh, any other, any other questions anybody has? Well, again, I just want to say thank you to, to Ronnie and David for, for this great presentation. Uh, this is the second year we've done this study, uh, and I think it's been a good continued report, especially now that we have some year-over-year -year data we can compare, uh, and our, our hope is to, to continue to keep doing this. But uh, for anybody on the call, you have their contact information there uh, on the slide, and we will see everybody on Thursday for our next presentation. And once again, thank you, Ron and David. Well, thank you all and good luck out there. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, everyone else. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you. Or, well, we'll see you hopefully on Thursday via Zoom.